This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. I have got a great show for you today, but first, let me tell you about one of today's sponsors, St. John's College. From Greek philosophers who are the wellspring of democratic ideals, to America's founding fathers, to contemporary critics who question everything, each is welcome at St. John's College, where students encounter Adam Smith and Karl Marx, St. Augustine and Friedrich Nietzsche, James Baldwin and Virginia Woolf. Here, there are no secondary sources, no experts, and no one telling you what to believe. Rather, there are original sources and a community devoted to collaborative inquiry, intellectual humility, and the discomfort that comes from diverse opinions. Explore 3,000 years of human thought on campuses in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Annapolis, Maryland. For master's degree candidates, we also offer studies in the great texts of the East, in person or online. Learn more at sjc.edu slash reason. That's sjc.edu slash reason. sjc.edu slash reason. Check out St. John's College. So you've probably heard that millennials and Gen Z are going to be the first generations of Americans to have lower standards of living than their parents. It's too expensive to go to college, to buy a house, to have kids, you name it, goes this line of thinking. My guest today is here with good news. Younger Americans are actually doing better than Gen X was at the same stage, and they're in the same ballpark as baby boomers too, when you adjust for inflation and population. Jeremy Horpedal is a libertarian economist trained at George Mason University, who teaches at University of Central Arkansas. His work, which draws on the Census, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and other non-controversial sources, shows that young Americans are doing well and that economic mobility is the rule rather than the exception. I talk with him about why politicians and media sources get basic economics wrong, why it's vital to always adjust for inflation and population growth, and how growing up in the Dakotas gives him a different, more optimistic perspective on things than many in the academy. Because he's an economist, I also ask him about the economic plans of Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. His answers are as provocative as his research. Here is The Reason Interview with Jeremy Horpadal. Jeremy Horpadal, thanks for talking to Reason. Yeah, glad to be here, Nick. Thanks for inviting me. So you are um, you are a, a professor of economics at University of Central Arkansas, and that's in Conway, Arkansas. That's exactly right. Yep, Conway, okay. Arkansas. Where is Conway? And I believe it is mentioned in the novel True Grit, but other than that, I don't really know anything about it. Uh, it's near Little Rock, which is in the okay. very center of the state. So we're yeah. just we're part of the Little Rock metro area, and uh, about mm-hmm. thirty minutes to downtown Little Rock, where we are. I want to uh, talk with you in a bit about living in the uh, center of the country and uh, what is pejoratively called flyover country, but not, you know, not by the people who live there. Um, and um, we'll we'll get to that in a second. I want to, you know, I think I discovered you via your Twitter feed, which is fantastic. And in it, you're, you're in your name on Twitter or X, whatever we're calling it now. You say Jeremy and then in quote marks, adjusted for inflation or Pedal. Why, why is it so important to foreground uh, that you're doing something uh, adjusted for inflation? I guess part of it's a little bit of a joke to people who follow me that, you know, I, I, I often will present data and really try to tell people, yes, it's adjusted for inflation. And then people will still ask, uh, but is this actually adjusted for inflation? And yes, it is. But it's also, I think, you know, more broadly, I think when we're thinking about trends and standards of living over time, which I write a lot about, you know, we would, do want to make sure that we are correctly adjusting for inflation. We know what that means, right? I think, you know, if you look at just the, you know, like many of my libertarian friends are, are you know, love to show the chart of the value of a dollar falling over time, and it's worth a, a 19, you know, a nineteen thirteen dollars worth of nickel now or less. And yes, this is true, which means we must make those adjustments. That doesn't mean that we've become worse off, though, since 1913, yeah. right? It's, no, it's, that is, uh, yeah. to my mind, uh, you <laughs> know, and I get it. And, you know, of course, yeah. I would rather live in a world without the Fed, uh, I guess. But I never understand. That argument is always made as if it shows that we are poorer now. And it just, it really yeah. doesn't do that. Like, yeah, you know. 
Yeah. I mean, so anyway, the, the adjusted for inflation in the name is kind of a yeah. a nod to many of those things that I and you, right about. you also do another thing often that you will also adjust uh, per capita so that, um, you know, it's not just, okay, inflation, but then also like if there are more or less people, that kind of is, a, is an important factor when you're doing analysis. Right. And I think that gets missed, including in, I think what we'll talk about with generational wealth, a lot of people will talk about, okay, you know, the boomers, when they were young, had X percent of the total wealth. Okay, but there are a lot more people now than, than when the boomers were young. So we need to make, you know, putting on per capita basis, I think, I mean, sometimes looking at the absolute share of, of whatever makes sense. But, you know, we want to know, do people have more wealth? What share they have is not really relevant to that question. So. Yeah, and particularly with generational issues, the baby boom was so much bigger than what preceded it. And, right. and it was also bigger than Gen X, which isn't even really a full generation in terms of right. the same number of years. That often gets lost. Let's talk about this because I think when I first uh, you know, started following you, it, it was we were in the thick, and this going back you know, a decade or more, but um, definitely over the past five or six years, there's been this sense that millennials and Gen Z, and maybe even worse for Gen Z, are like, they're just finished. They are, you know, uh, the world that they will inherit will just be ashes. And they're lucky to have, you know, to get to sleep on a couch a couple nights a week in their parents' second home, and all of that is disappearing. Um, I, not too long ago, Scott Galloway, the uh, uh, business school professor at NYU, uh, was on Morning Joe and he was talking about, you know, it is a fact that like he and he meant boomers, you know, we've we've left the world behind where our kids just won't be able to, to get to where we were. A lot of your work challenges that. Can you put this in context? What, you know, if you're matching up, uh, you know, people at 35 or whatever, whatever, you know, boomers at 35, Gen X uh, at 35, millennials, Gen Z, not, obviously can't be at that yet. Uh, what are what are you finding? Yeah, I think you know. I think you're right. There is a lot of despair out there about you know the state of of the youth today, both from them saying we can't get ahead, and yeah. and then older people either either sympathizing with them or in some cases blaming them, saying you know it's because of your you know your lavish spending style, yeah, your, your avocado toast yeah. and you yeah. know triple venti lattes. Yeah, right. So I think there's a lot of that. I think what what I try to do with the work I've done is to say, well, let's let's look at the data. Let's see how people are doing, you know, mm -hmm. are they doing better in some areas? Are they struggling in others? And then, you know, can we try to understand why that is if there are areas they're struggling? So one area I've looked at is wealth. So total net worth is something that there's a number of surveys that measure this, but but one pretty good one is done by the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, and they do this, they do it every three years, but they also kind of provide estimates, you know, in between the surveys of people to get pretty detailed um, information on what people's wealth is, uh, and then they can break that up in many demographic ways. One way you can look at it is by people's age or what generation they belong to. So I've done a number of, and I know you've seen this chart many times, but we're on a podcast, so I can't show you a chart. So let me describe it, right? If you overlay each generation, uh, and I do in my chart, boomers, Gen X, and then millennials or millennials with all the youngers, younger people, put them all together, and you overlay them at the same age, right? So say at the same age, how much wealth did this group have per person or per household? How much wealth did this group had? What the chart shows you is that in general, we now have some overlap where millennials and boomers are the same age. What happens is that for the younger generations, at first they start out behind. So Gen X started out below where boomers were at the same age. And then millennials started out below where Gen X and boomers were. They start out with lower wealth when they're young. And we can talk about there's a number of reasons why that makes sense it would be lower. But as they get into their prime working years, into their 30s and 40s, they start to catch up and to exceed the prior generations. So if we look at today, where millennials are in terms of wealth, uh, they are going to be above where past generations were. If we look at where they are in terms of income, this is from a paper by uh, Kevin Corinth at AI and Jeff Laramore from the New York Fed. They find a similar thing when you look at incomes, and they actually stack it back six six generations and say, each generation, when they get to their prime working years, they're earning 15 to 20% more per year in real inflation-adjusted terms than, 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 than the prior uh, generations are. So I think that there's a lot to unpack there, but that's kind of the general data I try to show and keep updating is to say, and when I started doing this, millennials are actually a little bit behind. They were a little behind the past generations. 
in the most recent data going up through early 2024, it looks like they're starting to race ahead pretty quickly of where past generations were at the same age. Um, you know, and uh, before I, I have some s specific questions about that, I hear in these kinds of conversations, people talk about Gen Z or people in their early 20s not able to afford homes. And, you know, my response to that is, uh, you know, what, who, who can afford a home in their early 20s? Like there seems to be this weird idea that if, you know, if 60 year olds have a house at, you know, at 60% of 60 year olds own their house, every person at every age range should be, you should have that same outcome. And that just seems kind of insane to me, um, that, we are defining, I don't know, defining wealth or poverty downwards or something like that. Yeah, I think that, you know, I think the better way to look at it is, again, to look at this each generation at the same age. And I think you're, you're right that it's, homeownership rates in your 20s are very low for every generation. Mm -hmm. Not many people own them. I think as we move forward, here we do see there actually is some truth to this, this, this complaint that home ownership rates for young generations, like so for Gen Z or millennials, when they're young, actually are a little bit lower than past generations. So they aren't buying homes quite as early. And we kind of see that filtering through each generation a little bit lower. Um, and if we look at just kind of basic measures of, you know, what's a median home cost today, we look at median income for these, for these different generations, even though they do have higher real median incomes, home prices have gone up so much that actually the, the home in relation to their income is more expensive. So they've got ahead of prices in general, right? Food, clothing, gasoline, like their incomes have beat those, but housing prices have been rising so fast since the 80s. And especially in the last decade, uh, the incomes just have not kept up. So that's one I would, I would put that in the column of, yes, the complainers are right that just housing prices are going up too quickly everywhere. Right. That is something we should worry about and think about how do we fix that? But it, it also doesn't mean, at least for uh, millennials and older Gen Z, it, uh, I mean, it means that they're spending more on housing, but they are able to buy houses at the same rate as previous generations. It's close, but, but it yeah. is a little bit lower. So, okay. so the home ownership rate, I think if you measure it correctly, which is to include, I mean, if you just look at people who are independent of their parents, yeah. right? So, so they are their own household, then the home ownership rates are similar to past generations. But there mm -hmm. are a lot more young people today that are not their own household. They're still part right. of their parents' household. Yeah. So when you include them, if you look at all members of Gen Z, not just those who have gone you know, out right. of their parents' household, homeownership rates are a few percentage points lower than in the past. Yeah. Uh, it's not a dramatic in, difference, but it's, it, is, it is there a little bit. And can we, uh, just to uh, you know, kind of uh, give a larger context, when we're talking about homeownership rates, at least since what, like the 60s or 70s, Generally speaking, more than 60% of Americans' uh, households on average own their house. And that was a dramatic bump up uh, before World War II or right after. But, yep. you know, does it matter that much or, or how does it matter if we are at 67% overall household ownership rates versus 62? Is that, you know, is that the difference between being in America and being in a third world country, or is that the difference between being in uh, New York and Pennsylvania? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I tend to take the perspective that it's not the end of the world, but maybe you can make the world a little bit better if we can figure out how to get housing prices under control. I think that when we think about wealth and people trying to build wealth, um, you know, it's, it's a cliche to say, you know, your home is your most important financial asset, but it's true. I mean, if you look at, especially young people today, so if you look at young people today, or you look at boomers when they were young, about 40% of their wealth is in their home. So for the for the average person, and that's including people that own and don't own homes, 40% is the average. So for people that do own homes, it's an even larger percent of their of their net worth is in their home. Um, and the, the challenge here, I think, is for renters, the, which renters know this, the reality is your rent is, can reset every year, right? So rents are generally gonna go up every year as housing prices go up. Once you own your home, then, you're you're building wealth as housing prices right. go up. So and your your house price or your mortgage rate is generally going to go down as a percentage of your income because yep. if you've got a 30 year fixed note and it's a thousand bucks, you know, when you're twenty five and you're making thirty grand, it's still gonna be a thousand bucks when you're making eighty grand or whatever later. Yep. Yeah, even you know, if your property appreciates your taxes mm -hmm. will go up a little bit, but in, in the total mix of it, like 
this is going to be it's going to be a smaller percentage. Of Having said that, uh, particularly with uh, you know millennial, every every generation seems to start adult life a little bit later than the one before it, and certainly boomers uh, on mass went to college in a way that their uh, their parents certainly did not, and that kind of pushes back when you start your. You know, I, I don't want to say adult life because you, you do a lot of adulting in college and whatnot, but you know, you don't, you don't get put on the career path quite as fast, which kind of pushes everything back. Is part of the issue here that millennials and Gen Z in general are going to school longer and starting, you know, their post education life a little bit later? And I'm thinking back to my own experience, which I don't know how typical this was, but throughout my twenties, I moved, uh, God, you know, I moved from uh, New Jersey to New York to Philadelphia to Buffalo to L.A., um, you know, and, and like I couldn't have owned a house if I wanted to. I didn't have enough money anyway, but I wouldn't want it to. I didn't start my career job really uh, until I was about 30, um, you know, so it would make sense that I wouldn't buy a house, you know, in my 20s. But is is that at work here with um, some of the differences in, in consumption purchases or patterns for sale? Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely a big part of it, and I think this this factors into when we look at the trajectory of people's wealth of their lifetimes. It factors into it in actually a number of ways. Not only are you starting out later in terms of when you start on the career path and building wealth and owning a home, uh, but also you're you're starting out with more debt, right? You're you're kind mm -hmm. of front loaded with debt because of of mostly student loans, maybe some credit cards too. Uh, the longer you're in college, the bigger those are going to be. Right. But then the flip side of that is that. You know, as people are more educated, they have higher earning potential, right? So, if we look Which at may not become apparent until like five or ten years into a into a profession, right? That's right. Yep. So, I mean, obviously, lots of variation depending on the type of degree and the yeah. career you're in. But um, you know that you even after you start you know, enter the workforce, let's say you've gone to grad school, you know, you spent the first thirty years of your life in school essentially. Mm -hmm. Now you're thirty, you're starting out. You've got all this debt from student loans. That debt, you know, is not only is it on paper making your net worth look look, low, look lower. You're having to dedicate a lot of your income to servicing that debt rather than putting that towards you know building wealth right. in terms of a house. So, yeah. or started, or I would say uh, you know more buying stocks or something like you know buying mutual funds or any you're not buying any kind of asset that's going to appreciate in value. That's right. Yep. So you're you're not. You're just paying down debt, which you know, as you pay down debt, that does yep. increase your net worth, but but not as much as buying something where the value is going to increase. I mean, another interesting, as I look at the wealth data, if you look at um, the 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 home is the largest asset for mm -hmm. young people today, but their second largest asset actually is stocks and mutual funds. Mm -hmm. That's different from boomers. When boomers were the same age, their second largest asset was consumer durables, so cars wow. and appliances, they actually mm -hmm. own more in that than they had in stocks when they were the same age. And those, that are, is, those that, are depreciating assets. <laughs> right. And is that, <laughs> that mostly because things like mutual funds, as well as, uh, you know, kind of self-funded retirement plans really were not in vogue yet. Um, I mean, they were kicking around or at least certainly mutual funds were, but nobody, nobody was in the stock market unless you were kind of in, you know, the upper classes, it seems. Yeah, that's a part of it. But even if you look at the value of their pension plans, which would have been mm -hmm. more common then, they still have more in consumer durables than they do in their pensions yeah. uh, in terms of the value of those. So uh, they're, they're buying, you know, and part of that is cars and appliances were more expensive back then. So you right. buy them, but now, that's that's your assets, right? Uh, today, young people are much more likely to have money in the stock market, either directly or or through some sort of retirement account. Um, to talk about housing a little bit, you had you had written a post and you write at a uh, fantastic site called Economist writing or Economist writing every day, and there'll be a, links to that in the show notes. Uh, it's also in your Twitter uh, feed as well, um, or in your Twitter bio. Um, you, a while ago, you had talked about looking at the percentage of income that each kind of cohort, each age range, uh, spent on housing. Uh, it was starting in the mid '80s through uh, contemporary times, at f in your first iteration of that, you showed that uh, basically we're all spending about the same uh, percentage of our total income on housing as we were in the mid '80s. Um, you've adjusted that. Um, can you explain what the adjustment was? And you know, housing is housing more expensive as a percentage of income for younger people now than it used to be. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because here's 
you know, I like to look at the data and just mm -hmm. try to figure out, you know, I'm a libertarian classical liberal type of person, but I say, let's just look at the data and see what it says. And when I first look at this data, this is from the consumer expenditure survey, the BLS puts this out every year. And you can look at, you know, for various generations or different ages, how much are they spending on all the different things people spend money on? If you look at housing overall for young people, they're spending about the same percent of their income as people were in the 80s. It's pretty flat over time. Um, so I looked at that and said, hey, you know, this kind of goes against the narrative that housing is getting more expensive. You know, in some measures it is, but people are still spending about the same amount. Uh, Kevin Erdman, who I know has written a lot on housing policy, he's got two books on it. He, he said, no, you're wrong, Jeremy, and here's why. And he showed me the data. He said, if you break it down between people that own their home and renters, you get two different effects. For people that own their home, it's actually shrinking as a share of income over time. And for people that are renters, it's been going up. So when I see that average of it being flat, that's from you know smashing the two together, um, when in reality, uh, people who rent, who are seeing their market rents reset functionally every year, uh, they, they are, they're paying more as a percent of their income than they were in the 80s, which is when this series starts. That's why yeah. I think the 80s. What, what is the split in, among contemporary younger people? And I, I forget, was it under 35 or something like that, um, that you were looking yeah. at or under 30? But, um, you know, what's the split of renters versus owners in that? Uh, it's getting clo pretty close to 50-50. I mean, mm -hmm. for people that are, you know, around 35, it's, it's pretty yeah. close to 50-50. Okay. So, um, you know, that means that for, you know, when we look at the median, I think the median now is a homeowner, but yeah. a lot of people below the median are not. Right. Um, so it's, okay. it's pretty close to 50. I, you know what I like about this, and this is, you know, what I really respond to in your work is both the willingness to revise your your findings as you get more information, but also cutting things in, sep in different ways. You know, there can be aggregates, there can be medians or averages, et cetera. And that all kind of adds, you know, we, we never fully grasp social reality in any, you know, in any concrete way, but these all get us closer. Talk about what is making housing uh, more expensive, because this, you know, when you hear, uh, I don't know, you know, most policy or most politicians talk, it's, it's like a real mystery uh, why housing keeps getting more expensive. Occasionally they will say, well, it's because landlords are greedier or, um, you know, something is going on, but it's not, it's not very mysterious. Is it why housing gets more expensive? Yeah. I think that when you talk to economists who work on this, or you talk to people who work in housing policy, it's not a mystery. It's that it's just really hard in most places to increase the supply of housing. There are lots of government rules, various restrictions, zoning, a lot of them fall under zoning, but zoning is not the only thing that are going to just limit how quickly you can increase the supply of housing in places where people want to be. I mean, one thing you can look at the country and say, well, I mean, most of the country is vast, empty spaces. You can build housing anywhere. But but most people don't want a house, you know, as much as I, you know, love the Dakotas where I grew up, most people don't want a house in rural North Dakota. I mean, they want a house close to maybe not right in, but close to a city center where there are jobs, where there are where there's entertainment, where there's socializing. That's where most people want to be. And it's really hard to build new housing anywhere near where people want to be. Why? Why? And when did when did this start taking off? Because obviously there's a period, uh, you know, it's it actually started before World War Two, but certainly after World War Two. Uh, you know, I, I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up about 50 miles outside of, uh, of New York and New Jersey. And I, I grew up in a town that was founded in 1664, but it exploded after World War Two. And, at, you know, my hometown there are, you can just see where there were whole vast tracts of land that were developed, you know, within a two or three year period at different stages, you know, at, in the, in the fifties, sixties and early seventies. Um, so it, you know, we used to be able to build a lot of housing. What, yeah. when did that start to get so complicated? If you look at zoning, which is, I think, one of the main barriers to this, I mean, the zoning laws really go back over a hundred years in many, in many places. And, and, you know, New York was the first major city to, to adopt them. And a lot of cities copy that or adapt it for their own. But I think what you see over time is it's different in different cities because in some places, the, the current restrictions don't actually bind the supply that much um, because there might still be a lot of space that's close to the city center. I mean, I'm in Conway, Arkansas. Here, you know, there is still plenty of empty space that's close to either downtown Conway or downtown Little Rock where people want to work. There's still plenty of space. Uh, there's not a lot of space that's empty close to downtown Manhattan. I mean, there just isn't, and there hasn't been for a long time. So it's different 
wherever you look. But I think when zoning starts to actually have a bite to actually take an effect, it uh, depends on the city. And, and so we start to see for some cities, even in the 1980s, this is already having an effect and housing prices start to go up. Um, but I think for most places, like whether it's, you know, Conway, Arkansas, or Kansas City, Missouri, or, you know, Nashville, Tennessee, it's really not until the past 10 or 20 years that those restrictions, which have always been there, actually started to matter for where people wanted to build housing. Because the, so, these places are filling up more, and so they're hitting up against the pre-existing limits on things. Yeah, they're, they're hitting up. We've essentially, you know, being, you know, people want to be a certain distance from wherever right. the place, whether it's for work or amenities, people want to be, don't want to be three hours. I mean, people, I guess, I mean, I heard, I heard of one person who could commuted three hours to DC every year, every day, but most people don't want to do that. Right. You right. want to live out in Shenandoah and commute three hours. Yeah. Most people want to have a reasonable commute at most, you know, 30, 45 minutes. Um, and we've, we've run out of space in many places in the country. Yeah. So, and everywhere you look, you know, in, uh, I was on a property tax commission in Montana. They blame it on billionaires buying ranches. You go to Springfield, Ohio, they blame it on Haitian migrants. Everyone right. blames it on someone else. But yeah. really the problem is that the supply restrictions are now kicking in everywhere in a way that hasn't been true for most of the country. Do the you do you feel that, uh, you know, you mentioned zoning be about 100, uh, 100 or a little bit more than 100 years old in America, you know, and it's kind of an urban technology. Um, you know, that made sense, maybe made sense back then. Uh, you know, we can argue about that. But are people starting to realize like, oh, we are being governed by the dead hand of, you know, urban planners you know, from <laughs> 1910 or something like that. And maybe it's time we fundamentally rethink how we, you know, how we, how we kind of lay the, uh, you know, the invisible grammar of the city or something like that. I think people, you know, are starting to slowly realize that. Um, I think in places where it's you know, most a big problem, like California, actually are, we think normally California is very slow to move on things like this. But I think in the past couple of sessions, California has passed a lot of good reforms that have rolled back a lot of things about zoning because not because they've been more enlightened there, but I think just because the problem has been much worse there. So I think people do start to realize it and even have, you know, in Northwest Arkansas, which is near me, but it's where Walmart headquarters is and a lot of their Fortune 500 companies. They've started to have a lot of reforms there because housing prices have been through the roof there the past decade. Um, so I think where people start to realize it when it actually starts to matter in their community. Um, but I think that people can hear the other explanations, greedy landlords or, you know, you know, corporations buying up housing that like if people hear those, then you're going to have the wrong solutions to the problem, I think. So that's why I think that, you know, it's, it's not automatic that people will roll these back when it becomes a problem, but at least becomes possible. And a lot of states now have had, I mean, I saw a map recently of all the states that have had housing bills either introduced or passed in the past year. And it's like half the states, at least someone is, you know, trying to get some changes passed, but it's really hard. Zoning is at the very local level. Sometimes states set the guidelines for it, but it's, you know, city by city reforms in some cases, what we're talking about. So it can be, yeah. it's- a, and, it's, and the zoning often, or, or rather people who sit on the zoning board or have the ear of zoning and planning commissions have a lot of local power. I mean, they're, or they're, they're predisposed towards wanting the status quo. I've, I've lived in towns of eight or 10,000 people. And weirdly, it seems as if the, you know, the power brokers there have a tighter hold on power than in a, in a place like New York City sometimes. Yeah, they do in, in many cases. And also, you know, people that own homes already, I mean, if you own a home already, in a whether it's a town of 8,000 people or a town of 8 million, I mean, you don't really care that much, right? I mean, you're going to, the prices are going to go up. You're going to see that appreciation when you sell your house. Yes, everything's more expensive, but now you have this more equity. Like for people that own homes, they, I think they say, you know, why change things? It's working for me. But for people that don't own homes yet, they would like to, or people that just want to permanently rent, uh, this is a real problem that we're seeing. And I think that, you know, that that's the challenge though for incumbent homeowners. If you change some zoning rules, it could make the value of their property go down and, and they don't want that to happen, understandably. Uh, but that's why it becomes an even harder thing to unravel. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Lumen, L-U-M-E-N, the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. You just breathe into it first thing in the morning, and the Lumen app lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs 
and it gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals, so you always know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. I've tried Lumen, and I've got to tell you, it's a great tool for motivation and information. It's easy, and it's fun to use. Your metabolism is your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. Lumen can also help women track their cycles, as well as the onset of menopause, making it easier to keep your metabolism healthy during hormonal shifts. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash interview to get 15% off your purchase. That's L-U-M-E-N dot M-E slash interview, lumen.me slash interview, and get 15% off your purchase. And now back to the Reason interview. Um, do you feel like younger people, uh, you know, I, I guess... Uh, going back to kind of these questions about millennials and uh, and Gen Z, you know, they the the rhetoric, the large narrative that they are hearing, and also that most boomers, I would say, and Gen Xers, you know, and we'll forget about the silent generation for now, but you know, the the, the large narrative that is being spun is that you got, you know, and it sounds a lot like Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton in 2016 saying, you know what, the system is broken, you are getting screwed. Um, you will you will have a lower standard of living than we did, or or than your grandparents did, et cetera. Um, where does that where does that focus come from? Where does that story come from? Especially when it is not actually rooted in everyday reality. Um, young people are not doing worse than their parents. Young people are not you know the serfs in in a new neo feudalist economy or anything like that. Boy, you know, that that's a really great and complicated question. I think that, I mean, I think you always see this, that, that uh, you know, younger generations always think they have it harder and, and older generations always think the young people are, you know, screwed up in some way. So I think that's just a perpetual problem throughout history. But I think, you know, there are, I mean, I hate to blame inflation and everything, but I think one of the things about, you know, adjusting for inflation is that people do anchor on nominal prices. I mean, people say, well, you used to be able to buy a good house for $100,000, and that's true, but we have to look at incomes have gone up too. Now, with housing, it's actually true that, that it's gone up faster than income, but for most things, uh, incomes have gone up faster than prices. So I think that a lot of the, some of the, this is just my intuition, but I think some of the doomerism comes from the fact that people can't do that inflation adjustment in their head. And they look and say, in the past, it seems like everything was cheaper, right? There's this, there's this meme you see sometimes to say, oh, look at this happy woman from 1980 with her $20 of groceries. And like, yeah, that's true. But you know what incomes were in 1980, right? So I think people like anchor on these prices and I think that just feeds into it. And then, and then you have voices out there that tell them, yes, this will be the only generation to be worse off than its parents. And they say, yeah, you're right. And they, I think that people then don't know who to blame. They think this is this is bad, and so they who they blame kind of is just random in some sense. Um, and I guess it reflects their ideological points of view, right? Because if if you're more on the left, you might blame the producers of goods for jacking up prices and you know being greedy. If you're on the right, you you blame I don't you know maybe international bankers, but oftentimes the laziness of younger people who just aren't willing to work for it enough or something. Yeah, I think that you who you blame might be, you know, based on your your own ideology or just on you know random chance, right? You you think that this thing caused it, and, and it's just we need to we need to try to cut through that and say, okay, where are the areas where it actually is harder? Housing is, I think, a big one, and then what are the reasons why that's happening? And I think I think zoning, other supply restrictions are what it is, but then look at the other areas. I try to do this is say. Look, actually, for on most things, we're actually way better off than our parents. Um, on many measures of income and wealth, on many measures of health, like a lot of things actually are oh, better. Like on every measure of, <laughs> of health, right? I mean, in terms of longevity and, you know, at any given point, I mean, there are, I'm sure you and I have both had things that would have killed our parents, you know, if, if they were five years old and got it. And, 
you know, we just we we're not dealing with many of the same things. Um, yeah. So you, a, a lot of your work looks at kind of the ways in which small increments of economic growth compound over time. Uh, this seems to me to be part of this conversation, too, that, um, you know, we, we are living in a particular moment at time. And like it could be, you know, after the financial uh, crisis in, in 2008, like you're like, oh, my God, this is terrible and I'm never coming back from it or something like that. But could you? Talk a little bit about why economic growth and, you know, the difference between, say, 3% annual economic growth uh, versus 2% economic growth. How, do, how does that compound over time? And how does that difference, uh, you know, which in any given year might seem really small, but it actually is hugely important to uh, increasing our living standards? And this is something economists love to talk about, right? The, the importance of these small differences in growth rates, and they really compound over time. Um, you know, if you look at the very long run, so you look U.S. growth back to say 1800, the average growth rate per person adjusted for inflation is about 1.4 percent. 1.4 percent. That's not even that high, right? I mean, if we have a quarter where it's 1.4 percent, people say, eh. I don't know if the president can get reelected, only 1.4%, but that's the long run average, including the ups and downs and trying to adjust for prices. Um, that's you know the, the growth rate that we've had, and we are the most successful country in history in terms of a large country in terms of having growth. Um, so I've done you know a number of different you know scenarios on on my blog, you know looking at well, what if it was you know a quarter point higher? What if it was a quarter point lower? Right. Um, you know, a big difference, if it was one percentage point lower, which is a big difference. I mean, that is when the average is only 1.4, being one lower is a big deal. But our standard of living would be similar to Bolivia right now if it had been 1% lower throughout our whole history. Uh, if it had been just a little bit higher, right, if it had been about, I think it did a half percent higher, you know, our, our income today could be two or three times as much as it is. These things really add up. So we need to think about, as we're thinking about policy and we're thinking about entrepreneurship, you know, what leads to higher growth rates or what might slow them down? Yeah, what, what are what are the keys to, uh, you know, and again, obviously you can't, you know, you can't say with absolute certainty if you <laughs> do this and, you know, you'll you'll grow. But like, what are the basics of economic growth? How do we ensure economic growth over the long term? So when you look across countries, um, one of the big things I like to use is what's called the Economic Freedom of the World Index, which which measures countries on a number of different things with on a broad measure they call economic freedom. And this includes things like security of property rights, you know, tax rates, uh, regulations, inflation rates, all these sorts of things. And so I think all those things matter. Uh, but what they find in, in a lot of research looking across many countries across time is that more economic freedom leads to higher rates of growth. And, and this is true and a big picture, right? And you see a picture of North Korea versus South Korea, right? Uh, but but even on small ones, right? You know, even where you know Europe is is very much a market economy society. I mean, they're they're especially Western Europe and have been for a long time. But they've always had a little more regulation than us, a little bit higher taxes, and that has added up over time to where now the U.S. is just so much richer than every country in Europe, and it's not just a little bit. I mean, it's we've really, especially even in the past decade, a lot of like Western Europe has been stagnating and the U.S. has continued with our one and a half to two and a half percent average growth and has really just taken off. And I think now you start to really see big differences, whereas, you know, in 1980 or 1990, we would have been, you know, maybe close to Germany and the U.K. Mm -hmm. Now we're like way ahead of them. And, that's and what, what does that translate into when you say, you know, we're a much wealthier country? Um, does it mean that Americans you know, have more stuff as well as savings and wealth? Or how do, how do we measure that? Yeah, I mean, you can measure it in a lot of ways. Some of it is stuff. I mean, if you look at, you know, percent of households that have an electric clothes dryer or percent of households that have, you know, multiple cars, I mean, some of it is stuff. Um, some of it is, you know, access to better health care. I mean, I know that you can look, a, there are a lot of things about the US you can look at and say, wow, it looks like the healthcare system here stinks. If you look at life expectancy, infant mortality, and then we spend a lot more, you say, man, maybe that stinks. But actually, I mean, a lot of what our healthcare spending goes to is things to prolong people's lives. So we have like better cancer survival rates than most other countries, right? So you look at things like that, where, where the spending is actually going. Uh, so a lot of our, you know, additional income goes to spending on healthcare. But, you know, while there are numerous problems with our healthcare system, 
in many ways, we have a, we have a pretty good system compared to most other countries. And and, I don't wanna, uh, oh, uh, yeah, ahead. you uh, yeah, you you don't want to yeah, endorse yeah. what we have. No, no, it's, I, it's I don't. Better, I don't wanna, it could be worse. It and I don't want to hang my hat too much on that, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that you know, it's not just health. Like on lots of other things, like yeah. Americans travel more. I mean, right. a lot of that travel might be within the U.S., but we spend a lot more on yeah, things but it's like a, that. It's a big country. It's Most big Europeans country, yeah. travel within Europe, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's like, uh, and you know, one of the things that I probably first picked this up uh, on your Twitter feed. Uh, if you look at all of the OECD countries, you know, which is a shorthand for kind of developed economies, and then look at American states, even states like Mississippi, which is considered, you know, a very poor state in the United States, per capita income, a median per capita income is actually better than a lot of places in Europe. So like there's you know, there's there's we're not talking about nothing, right? When we talk about differences between Europe. Uh, the generic European country and America. Um, and it, it also gets confusing too, right? Because place, many Scandinavian countries uh, have rate higher than we do on economic freedom. Um, so it's, you know, n none of this is kind of jingoistic, like America is great, you know, and Europe is all bad. It's much more complicated than that. But you're saying that for economic growth, economic freedom is really the most reliable indicator. The, the more economically free you are, generally you're going to have better growth rates. Yeah, that's right. You know, in broad terms, right? And as I said, you know, into this measure of economic freedom, there are like 50 things that go into it. And so we could debate, you know, what's the trade-off? Is property rights more important than, than a tax system, right? And there's been a lot of research on this. But in general, when you lump it all together, countries with higher economic freedom have higher growth rates over time. Yeah. Um, what about mobility? This is another thing, and I know you've worked with people uh, like Scott Winship at the American Enterprise Institute and others. Um, you know, one of the arguments now about why things are worse for young people than they used to be is like, you know what, like uh, you know, if you were born in 1960, you were going to be doing better than your parents who might have been born in 1930. Um, you know, but then if you were born in 2000, like you got no chance of outstripping your parents because mobility has gone. Um, is that an accurate uh, assessment of economic prospects in America? I think it's not accurate. I think that there is still a lot of mobility. If we look at, you know, comparing people to their parents is one way of looking at it. I think that the, the best way we can look at mobility is actually look at people that have migrated to the U.S., right? If you look at, if you're just comparing people to their parents, that's one thing, right? We do want people to be better than their parents. But new immigrants that come to the U.S. can very quickly move up the scale if you look at the incomes of people, and there's some selection effects, right? People coming from India or Mexico, they have much higher incomes than the people that were there. Of course, maybe they're, they're the more ambitious ones, of course, but but still, I mean, we are a society where people can really move up. But even if you're comparing people to their parents, I mean, the only you know slice of the distribution where people generally don't do better than their parents is at the top. People that are at the, for people that are born into you know the top decile or the top quintile or the top one percent, I mean, they have trouble getting getting ahead of their parents because their parents were already so successful. Uh, for people that are towards the bottom half, much more of them ex do better than their parents. Not all of them, and we should worry about, you know, is that rate of mobility going up or down over time? But there's still a lot of mobility in terms of where you are in the income distribution um, in the US. And there, there's I don't, and there's mobility in Europe too. I mean, it's not like they're done there, right? I mean, there there is, but those are also largely, you know, market economies. So I think that we do still do see a lot of that, um, there's by some measures, there might be a little less than the past, but um, I think, you know, that's something which is not, that has not gone away. So that's another thing where. And yet we talk about it as, as a <laughs> fact, right? That if you were, you know, you're never going to do better than your parents. And it's one thing if, if you're born into the, you know, the, the top third of income earning, uh, an income earning household. Um, yeah, it's going to be harder for you to do better than your parents. Um, I know I was, I think I have two adult children. It's going to be hard for them to do better than me uh, because they started out pretty well off. I was able to to outstrip my parents that when I got my first full time job after college. My parents didn't one graduated high school, the other didn't. It was really easy to do better than them. Yeah. Um, but my kids had a fabulous childhood compared to mine, and and their adulthood will be pretty good too if if they're within um, you know uh, shouting distance. So. Yeah, I mean there are these you know really long run 
data sets, Raj Chetty has a lot of these where he looks at, oh, you know, in the 40s and 50s, people were you know, a lot better off than their parents were 20 or 30 years ago. But there you're comparing to the Depression, right? It's like right after the Depression, people are much better off than their parents were. Oh, not shocking. And the further you get away from the Depression, okay, there's less of that. But, you know, I think that is just, that's just a sign of, you know, the fact that we are such a high income country. Yeah. Which yet- we really didn't become until after World War II. Um, you know, in, in, in many ways, you know, many, most countries were relatively poor. The middle class was kind of underdeveloped in most uh, countries. It's also interesting when you look at this stuff, which libertarians are loath to do or, or you know, so, uh, have a complicated relationship. When you look at income after tax and transfer payments, because we have this incredibly large, too large in, in my view a uh, welfare state where we take money, uh, you know, we tax wealthy people who pay most of the taxes, and then we give money and opportunities to people without as many resources. And that flattens things out more too. But we seem not to talk about that very often. Yeah, I think that, you know, there are, in general, when people try to measure inequality over time, you can either look at market income, or you can look at, you know, post tax and transfer income. And I think that you know, the post tax and transfer income is important to look at because it says, okay, given our existing system of taxes and welfare state, you know, how are people actually doing after that? Um, because I think a lot of people who focus on inequality and, and focus on that as a, you know, a major problem are, are usually saying we need to do more to help people out that are, that are not doing well. Uh, but to see how well they're doing with our current system, you have to look at after taxes and transfers. Now, I think even knowing that there, you could still make a criticism of the current system, either thinking it should be bigger or thinking it should be smaller. But I think that there, there's that's often dismissed as saying, well, that's not what the market is, but that's true. But we need to look at how does the current system do, but also to be thinking about how does the current system, say, influence economic growth rates, right? I think that's that, to get back to that part, you have to think about uh, all those effects in the long run. Uh, and I guess it's also very hard with mobility. Like everybody kind of, at least uh, in the abstract, wants to increase mobility, but they don't want to increase mobility, like downward mobility for themselves or, or their children, right? And so, right. you know, and yeah. it's likely that, you know, policies that might increase mobility upward is also probably going to shake things up, uh, you know, coming down as well. Right. I mean, they're kind of, with mobility, there are two ways to look at it. One is just, you know, what, you know, quintile did you start out in? Where'd you end yeah. up? But that means anyone who moved up, someone else must have moved down, right? Mm-hmm. The other way to look at it is, you know, do you just have more income or wealth than your parents, right? Not where are you in the distribution, but do you have more, right? And when you look at things that way, you get a lot more, you know, optimistic results as far as how people are doing. Yes, they may not have moved up to the next, you know, quintile from the bottom, but the average income in the bottom quintile is much higher than it was in the past. So yeah. even if they're still down in the bottom, that, that group is doing much better than the past. Um, one uh, thing that you've written about uh, recently, because obviously we're in an election cycle, um, you have a uh, chart that you put up uh, saying, uh, are you better off than you were four years ago? Which is a question that at least since Ronald Reagan, this was you know, kind of the jerk store line he had that wiped out Jimmy Carter. You know, are you better off now than when you know, uh, this guy was elected? And in that chart, what is fascinating, you look at uh, uh, the start of term through October of, of an election year. And um, under Carter, people were far worse off. They were like, they had seven and a half percent less uh, wage growth in those years. Under Reagan, it was flat, but a little bit negative. Under Bush, one who lost, also negative. Clinton, uh, a little bit positive. Uh, Bush, two, positive. Obama negative, but it got reelected, uh, you know, for reasons that we could talk about. Trump did spectacularly well, and yet he <laughs> lost election. Uh, and Biden is not doing so well, uh, but he's he's about the same. Talk a little bit about this. Like, um, you know, why do we know how much better, you know, do we know whether we were better off four years ago or not? And then how does that factor into people? deciding like, yeah, I want to keep this person in the White House or I want to bring in some new bump. Yeah, I think that, you know, when you look at that, that I've done it with wages, I've done it with median mm-hmm. incomes, like none of that seems to line up with who won. I know yeah. politicians asked this, Reagan did, they asked it all the time. But, you know, where people were 
compared to four years ago, it doesn't seem to actually matter. Uh, what, what, what does seem to matter is growth in the past year. Like mm-hmm. they should be asking, are you better off than you were one year ago? That actually just yeah. seems to be a better predictor of it. But I think that, you know, people probably don't have a good sense. I think you've seen a lot of this lately, especially during high inflation times that people say, oh, prices are 20% higher than four years ago. And yeah, they are, but wages have actually grown faster than that. Mm-hmm. People, people don't always perceive that, right? Or they right. So when you, up, when you yeah. see like a $6 a uh, dozen uh, eggs costing six dollars a dozen or something like that and you remember them costing two dollars you're like the, the whole world is falling apart right so they'll, so people will focus on the few prices that have gone up uh, but they also i think people underestimate how much wages are growing um you know maybe they maybe either theirs didn't grow or maybe theirs grew a lot but they thought they're special like oh mine went up but the average person must not have gone up so i think that people are just you know at all times, I think that's true, but especially in times of high inflation, I think people are just really bad at kind of in their head doing the calculation of, am I better off? I mean, I don't, I don't know, am I? Um, so I think that not only are people are bad at that calculation, but when I looked at the data, it doesn't actually seem to matter. You know, it doesn't seem to predict at all. It seems to almost predict the opposite of uh, who's going to win. So it's, how, uh, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? When were you born? I was born in 1980. Okay, so uh, you kind of like for really high inflation this last few years probably has been the first time that you experienced that, certainly as an yep. adult, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Um, how did you respond to that? Um, you know, and I, I say I, I was born in 1963, so I kind of remember the 70s, but not really. I was too young and, you know, I wasn't mm-hmm. paying for anything. Um, but I could hear, you know, you would hear adults talking about, you know, everything seems to keep costing more and more. And that's kind of true. Um, but this time around, it was like it was a little bit freaky to see, you know, kind of inflation really jack up. Yeah. Um, how, did, how did you you know, what was the emotional response you had to that? And can you talk yourself through it as an economist? Well, yeah, first of all, I'm a little weird because I'm an economist and I kind of follow, follow the data closely. But, you know, I think for me, you know, where I first really noticed it, I think, was in like fast food prices, I think. And those have actually gone up faster than, than most other things. So like, I remember, I think one day, I think I tweeted, I'm like, okay, the Taco Bell box is now like, whatever, like $2 more than it was, you know, now, now I've had it too. Right. Like, like, I think, I think that's where, you know, and that has been an area where, you know, prices have gone up a lot is for fast food and other restaurants to some extent. So I think, you know, seeing that being like, really like, you know, I mean, and, and, yeah, and if you're walking out of McDonald's and it costs like 13 bucks yeah. or something like it's like, yeah, the world is totally fucked up. Right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you, you go to go to McDonald's and, you know, I got wife and two kids and we order and it's like 40 bucks. I'm like, what? Come on. And I sound like an old man. Right. But, you know what? But, you know, then I think that, you know, even as an economist who knows it follows the data, sometimes it just shocks you to say, really, that's this, this is a $3 burger. It used to be a dollar. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's where I, like I noticed it most of all, I think, you know, like with the eggs, I think I know enough to know that, you know, eggs go up and down a lot. Um, but, but even that it was like, really $5 for a dozen. <laughs> I think, you know, so like those things, like things you buy regularly, like you notice them, but I think also, you know, during the height of the pandemic, a lot of people were moving and I would notice houses in my neighborhood selling for like way more than I'd paid for mine, like two years ago or, or three years ago. And like, I'm like, that house is smaller than mine. And it sold for a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars more than I paid for mine. Like, this is insane. This, this can't be real. Should we, and I'm like, should we sell our house? But, <laughs> but where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? Right. Right? It's happening everywhere. So like, I know like big things like that, even things you don't buy a lot. Like yeah. I just observe that price as people sell their homes. Do you, uh, do you think we're past the uh, kind of peak inflation? And I realize that's, that's a bad thing to ask. And from a kind of uh, you know, certainly from the point of view of somebody like Milton Friedman or an economist, of, a monetarist economist, or what might have been called that in the past. I don't know if people still really define themselves in those terms. But, you know, we have been pumping so many more dollars into the system, both through the Treasury Department and through, you know, and borrowing money and then, uh, you know, through the Federal Reserve. Um, you know, Inflation has come down from its peak, but it's still above what it was, you know, maybe 10 years ago or something like, are we going to be in a a kind of era of inflation where it's generally higher and then we're going to have these flare ups when something lights a match to it all? I sure hope not, but maybe I think that, you know, if you look at, you know, since 2020, I mean, the big jack up in the money supply was, you know, April 2020 through about early 2022. 
after that, it kind of, you know, tailed off. And actually, the money supply is a little bit smaller than it was two years ago. So at least for now, I think inflation will be pretty muted and maybe even go much lower. But, you know, as you said, we've been borrowing a lot. As In the short term, we haven't been printing money to pay for that. So they actually haven't been. They've just been able to, to borrow it and not print more or not increase the money supply. But I do worry with, you know trillion two trillion dollar you know deficits becoming the norm now you know that they're going to have to monetize a lot of that debt in the future so yeah and that's pretty they, incredible uh, if we're looking at you know six trillion or more in annual spending by the federal government and if they're financing two trillion of that i you know i don't know like, i mean maybe i'll be dead before it, you know the bill comes due but that doesn't that's like yeah out. People are comparing, you know, the Harris policies versus Trump and saying, oh, <laughs> Harris will only increase the deficit by two trillion over a de- over a decade and, and yeah. Trump will increase by four trillion. I'm like, yeah, that's on top of the twenty two trillion it's yeah. already gonna be. It's like this is like, you know, a rounding error either way. It's like it's gonna be massive under either of their plans and either of any of the kind of status quo possible futures without any sort of big shakeup. And then there's a question of how all of this or how their policies will affect economic growth. That's right. Um, who, you know, broadly speaking, you, uh, you know, when I, I read through your feed, I don't, you know, you're clearly not a super Trump guy. You don't seem to be particularly fond of Harris. Who do you think from an economic point of view, you know, who, who do you fear the, who do you fear more? Um, well, I, I would, I would fear both of them with a, with a Congress that's of their same party. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, divided government, whether Congress itself is divided, or especially if you had a Congress of a different party from, from the president, I think that's like the best case scenario in the short term. So, you know, in, in our recent history, I think a Democratic president with a Republican Congress, that's like the best libertarians can hope for, at least right now. Um, so, I mean, you know, I think that um, as far as Harris's policies, I think, you know, she does say a lot of economically backwards things that I worry, but I'm actually not worried about her doing some of those things. Um, I am worried about Trump actually putting in, you know, 10, 20 percent tariffs and everything because a lot of that he could do without Congress. So, I mean, I don't want to say I'm less worried about Harris, but I'm, I'm a little less worried about Harris. And it's also, you know, non-economic things that I worry about more with Trump, too. But, like what? Uh, um, well, I mean, immigration policy, that is economic in some sense. I think just, you know, rhetoric around immigrants is something that uh, I think, you know, I remember in 2016, I kind of took the libertarian position that ah, they're both bad. But I had some of my libertarian friends saying, no, no, Trump is going to be worse. Like the just the demeanor of the country is going to be more negative. And um, and I said, no, that's not right. But I think I think they're actually right. That, like Trump is like just like changes the conversation on so many things in a way that makes, you know, people more pessimistic and more distrusting of the rest of the world. Um, what do you, like, um, in Arkansas is a state uh, that is, you know, mostly white and black. Um, and then there are, I think, the uh, amount of Hispanics and other, I, you know, I hate, uh, obviously Hispanic is not an, uh, it's an ethnicity, not a race, et cetera. But like there aren't, there aren't a ton of immigrants in Arkansas the way that there is in, you know, New York, Florida, Texas, California. What is your sense of, uh, you know, in Arkansas, are people pro or anti-immigrant? Um, are they, you know, how, do, how does it play out in a state like that, which I, and I hesitate to say this, I'm not shaming you, but I think Arkansas is like the 37th or lower, or maybe 47th, like state in the country in terms of kind of GDP. It's not a wealthy state. Yeah, I mean, in terms of... It? Yeah, how do they think about immigrants and immigration there? I think, you know, in broad terms, I think people are, you know, more anti-immigration here than, you know, the average American might be and when they think about it, you know, as a general issue. But I think, you know, on a ground level, when, when actually there are immigrants here, I think people are actually much more receptive than their kind of general anti-immigrant stance would be. Just as an example, uh, while we don't have as many immigrants as many other states, uh, we do have pockets of, of large groups. So uh, we have the largest concentration of people from the Marshall Islands in northwest Arkansas. There's actually a huge huge group there and they a lot of them they have a lot of the same challenges as other immigrant groups you know english is not their first language they're lower income um you know they have maybe different cultural customs different household structures right um but that but that northwest arkansas community has been very welcoming of them and you know they come to the legislature and say hey here's this issue we're facing in our community you know 
Um, what can we do? And actually, when you get to a specific issue like that, like here's these people, they're here and they're facing this challenge. I think people in Arkansas are very receptive to saying, you know, how can we help? And, and you know, how can we make you feel more welcome? Uh, but I think, you know, when, when you just talk about immigration generally, I think there, there is a more a feeling here of we don't want them here. And when they come, they hurt us. Um, that, you know, I think that's present throughout the country, but I would say a little, little more here than, I mean, this is definitely Trump country. I think this is not only did Trump win big here, this is one of the few states where Trump increased his vote share between 2016 and 2020. He, he won by even more, even a bigger blowout in Arkansas than, than before. So, I mean, it definitely is Trump country, but, um, I think that, you know, that, that when you get to actually people saying, you know, can we help out people that are actually here, people, people are very kind to immigrants and that's how how do you like teaching in arkansas you're from south dakota originally um and you went to school there and then you got a phd at uh, george mason university i want to talk a little bit about that in a second what's it like living in arkansas and um does do you think living in a place that's outside of a coastal elite enclave or even a major population say does that give you, um, you know, a different and perhaps more um, insightful perspective on a lot of things than if you're, you know, if you're a couple blocks from Washington Square and you might be an economist at NYU or Columbia and you're pissed because other people around you are, you know, making massive money and here you are like a relatively poor academic? Yeah, I mean, I, I very much like being in Arkansas. I think I have a I don't know how insightful it is, but I think I have a unique perspective in that, you know, in a lot of my work, you know, whether I'm on social media or, or writing academic papers, I'm kind of in like, I'm on the East Coast. Right? I'm talking to people in DC all the time. Uh, but, you know, in my life and in my teaching, I'm here. So I think I, I do kind of try to see, you know, it from different perspectives. Um, I mean, I like being here. I think that, uh, you know, I'm from, like you said, North Dakota, the Great Plains, also Iowa, Midwest. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, are you from North Dakota? And I, but you went to school in South Dakota. I, I lived in both North and South Dakota over oh my a, God. over a decade in each state. Okay, let's so. just call you. You're from the Dakota Territory, yeah. so the Dakotas plural. I lived okay. in Iowa, then moved over to Iowa for five yeah. years. So you know, all all in there. But you know, I think that, I mean, the South has lots of challenges, including historically with race relations. But other than that, it, it feels very much like the Midwest. It, it's people are very friendly. Cost of living is low. Uh, you know, as an academic, we don't we don't make massive salaries, but I think you can live very comfortably comfortably here on, you know, a salary like this or lots of middle income jobs. I mean, you know, you know, talk about you said, you know, Arkansas is towards the bottom in terms of economic rank. But I just pulled up the latest uh, data for a for a married couple with children in Arkansas, median income is over $100,000 for a married couple with children. And the cost of living here is, you know, 86% of the national average. So I think people here are able to, to live comfortably and, and live culturally the, the life they want. So uh, I have, I've been here for 10 years now and at, we love it here. What was it like growing up in the Dakotas? Uh, uh, these are two states that I've never been to. And, um, you know, when I think of them, I, I, Think of you know places like Williston, uh, North Dakota, which is near the Canadian border and is a, a fracking uh, epicenter, mm -hmm. uh, or you know things like Mount Rushmore in, in South Dakota and the Badlands. I mean, but just these broad expanses. I've lived in Texas and Ohio, which are very distinct from the Dakotas, but you get a sense of other things. Um, you know, what was it like uh, growing up in the real America? <laughs> well, you know, I, I did live in those two states, which are very low population, very low population density. But, you know, I always lived in cities of like at least 50,000 people. So I would say my experience growing up was similar to, you know, any kind of midsize Midwestern city. You know, it's you know, um, small neighborhoods. I remember, you know, we would when I was in elementary school, we could walk to school. We were that close. So it's walkable. Right. <laughs> you know, we think of it. I mean, there was, you know, good communities. I think that. Um, it was a place, you know, my, my family was a pretty typical Midwestern type family. You know, my dad worked for the phone company, worked there for 40 years. My mom worked at the phone company until they had two kids. Then she, then she stopped working and took care of the kids. You know, it was like, that's like a stereotypical, I think, background. But I think that, you know, in that we, you know, that we could, I could clearly see the upward mobility when I looked at, you know, my family compared to their parents. And then I'm looking at the opportunities that I had, I think, you know, maybe this is just me projecting my experience on the whole country, but like I see all kinds of mobility from my background, not only for myself, but for, you know, all of my peers as well. Um, I think that that was a very, you know, 
that really stuck with me as I, you know, turned into an economist, you know, in my, in my adult life that, you know, looking back on that experience, I think is something that I draw on a lot as I think about these big questions. Yeah, I wonder if that might be, uh, you know, I think a lot of optimism versus pessimism is temperamental, but I wonder how much of it is rooted in if, you know, you know, like you can, you see your grandparents, your parents and yourself. And like, if each generation is getting better, you're like, hey, you know what, this is a pretty good country, a pretty good system. Yeah. Um, you know, and we should figure out like how to make it easier for more people to, to pull off the trick that we might be doing. How did you end up at George Mason? And were you, uh, did you go there because it's a, uh, you know, kind of Austrian school and free market economics? And these are two distinct but overlapping mm -hmm. kind of schools of thought. Did you, did you go there because you were like, I want to be at the George Mason economics department? Um, I mean, that was certainly a part of it. I was certainly attracted to, to that aspect of it. But I think what more attracted me was that um, I, I was aware of the names of all the faculty there because they did so much stuff that wasn't just academic stuff, right? They're, they're doing blogs, they're writing popular books, they're doing podcasts, right? Like Econ Talk was, you know, like yeah, all this stuff. Sure. They're, they're, they're doing things to try to communicate to a broader audience than just their students and other academics. They're trying to, you know, go on Capitol Hill and testify on bills. They're trying to, you know, you know bring the economic ideas into the broader world. And I think that attracted me just as much as the fact that it was, you know, I mean, I've got my Hayek Mercatus mug here, right? I mean, that certainly attracted me. And, you know, as I'm talking to my undergrad professors about um, you know, where am I going to grad school, um, you know, they, one of them said to me at one point, he said, you know, grad school is not just like sitting around and talk about Hayek all the time. It's, it's a lot of math and hard work. He said, unless you, <laughs> unless you go to George Mason, then, then you'll yeah. get a lot of that sit around and talk about Hayek. Oh, okay. So okay. Well, let me check this out. Right. That's kind of how I learned about it. But then I, as I, you know, learned about all the faculty there, like a lot of them were just doing so much to try to make sure that the ideas that were, they're talking about in their research in the classroom, don't just stay there, that they do go and reach a broader audience. Yeah. That's a lot, you, of, what I've, what I've tried to do with myself. Yeah. Do you feel like, uh, you know, and this is, a, it might be partly explained by the difference in age between us, but, you know, it seemed uh, kind of at the end of the 90s that a lot of very basic, and I want to say libertarian ideas, and certainly libertarian economic policies that kind of run the table. So, you know, and it wasn't easy, and obviously it's never complete, but, you know, things like, well, you know, immigrants generally are pretty good, like uh, uh, geographic mobility is pretty good for economies as well as the individuals doing it or, or, you know, feeling the knock on effects that free trade and globalization, like more trade among more nations is generally good, uh, that markets are very good at uh, producing stuff and kind of uh, smearing it around. So more people have opportunities or, or things. Um, a lot of that seems to be kind of uh, waning uh, right now. Um, do you have a do you agree with that? Or, um, you know, how do you feel about a broad kind of libertarian, um, li classical liberal worldview? Does it seem rising or falling? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think in the long run, I think that the trend has been towards things being better. But I think that, you know, compared to, you know, where the world was in the late 90s, I think on a lot of things, we have kind of gone the, the wrong direction. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the, the 2016 election sticks out in my mind as one in which, you know, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the two major party candidates were both against new trade agreements, right? Including Hillary Clinton, right? Who had done a lot of her work as Secretary of State negotiating these, like just all of a sudden, like, boom, there they both were, right? And um, this is like the very strong, the very like 180 degrees from where I thought the conversation nationally had moved on, on that particular issue. I think you can see that in a lot of things too. Um, so I think that, I think, yeah, I think you're right that things maybe don't look quite as good for libertarian ideas as they might have, you know, in the nineties. But I think that, uh, right now in the nineties, we had balanced budgets and now we have the most unbalanced budgets ever. I think that, you know, the, the space for libertarian ideas to come in, I think the time is ripe. It's just a matter of communicating them in a way that, you know, isn't just, you know, the way that some libertarians communicate, uh, which I think in many cases is not helpful. Um, so I can just, you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? What do you mean? Um, I think just, you know, wanting to criticize everything government does or blame everything on government, I think is just unhelpful, especially when it's, you know, uh, it, it's like crying wolf, right? It's like, there are clearly some problems in the world. Housing, you can look at housing, right? 
where government is clearly the problem that's causing it, right? Um, but then, you know, and, and some of this is just like some libertarians are just like wrong on the numbers, right? They'll say like, oh, yes, things are worse off and it's because of the Fed, right? No, no, actually, we are better off than our parents and we are way better off than 100 years ago in spite of the Fed existing. And I think that I think that some libertarians just like want to just make their whole focus like attacking government. I mean, I know that's a part of libertarianism, but I think that, you know, you know, looking at the benefits of what a free society has given us, I think I, I try to focus more on those, um, maybe just as a counterweight to how some other libertarians approach it. Are you um, are you optimistic and uh, about the future? Uh, you've been, you know, I guess many of us are optimistic about the past, right? Uh, by definition. <laughs> uh, but but um, and when you talk to your students and things like that, you know, and I realize, you know, that's always a small sample and biased in all sorts of ways. But like, do you have a sense that um, you know the future is going to be better uh, than the past? And and do your students kind of go along with that? I mean, I'm very optimistic. I think you know. In spite of all the the challenges we face, whether it's federal budget deficits or, or housing policy, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic in the long run. Um, students, I mean, I I think they are. I think most students are just like trying to figure out their own lives. They're actually not thinking about these big picture questions when I get them as freshmen, right? So I teach a lot of the introductory courses, microeconomics, things like that. Um, but then I teach seniors too, and I think you know it's. You know, there it's even a, a bigger sample bias because then by seniors they are economics majors I'm talking to, right? Uh, but I think that you know, I think that students today are college is where they discover the fact that there even are these big questions to, to talk about. So that's you know one of the joys of teaching is kind of introducing people to those ideas. And economics classes are a great place to do it. But I, I guess I don't have a good grasp on whether the young people there are overly optimistic or not, or, or they're pessimistic. I think that, um, I think that they, the young people know the challenges that they face. I think that, um, they often, they just don't know always, you know, how do we fix that? Right. They know housing prices are extremely high. They don't, I don't think they yet know what do we do about it. Um, so that's why sometimes you get a blaming of the older generations or a blaming of, you know, corporate greed or whatever. They just, I think people just don't know who to blame. And so hopefully we can, push them a little bit, gently nudge them in the direction of thinking about things, you know, maybe the way I do, or at least, you know, in a way that's maybe a little more coherent. Hmm. Well, I hope, uh, I hope you're successful in that. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Jeremy and Justin for Inflation Horpital, an economist uh, trained at George Mason teaching at University of Central Arkansas. Uh, find him on Twitter and uh, read all of his work and at Economist Writing Every Day. Uh, Jeremy, thanks so much for talking to Reason. Thanks so much, Nick. I enjoyed it.